My name is Rich Schmidt. It's Friday, September 11, 2015. We're here in Nicholson Library with Marvin Laurie Hinberg. And our first question, as we always start these interviews out with, is why Linfield? <laughs> oh, why Linfield? Uh, well, for us, the choice was fairly obvious. I had um, uh, worked at the University of Idaho before I came here, and I had kind of reached a point where I wasn't going to go any further, really, uh, opportunities there. So I was looking for uh, dean's jobs, particularly in Oregon. We had fallen in love with Oregon. And um, so I came here to interview for the academic vice president's job. And after three days with Vivian Bull, I knew I wanted to work for that woman. Mm -hmm. uh, she was just wonderful. And we hit it off very well. And uh, so I went back and hoped against hope that, uh, uh, but of course the community and the campus was all very nice too. But it really, uh, I, I just felt a special bond to Vivian uh, huh. from the very beginning. So um, what was she like to work with? I, I like to say, I've said it many times, say it again on record, she was the best boss everybody deserves once in a lifetime. Uh, okay. She. Uh, she really gave me scope to do my job. Uh, she was there as a sympathetic ear when I needed to unload and talk, uh, always available. Uh, she could be direct and focused at times, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I just, you know, I, we all loved working for her. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was a great time. And Lori, what was your role? Well, I was, uh, I came as the spouse and I, talking about Marv coming to interview, I didn't come for the interview process. So I really didn't see campus until I moved here and it, I was just struck by the beauty of it and the town is a wonderful community. So we lived close enough to walk into downtown and to walk to campus and um, just enjoyed becoming a part of the, the Linfield community and going to events, going to sport, sports events, music, theater. Um, so I, I guess I was a, I was a fan. <laughs> um, so take us through kind of, um, you, you came interim president after Vivian left. How did that right. come about? Uh, <clears throat> that came about, I, I had not been a candidate for the presidency. I had um, um, decided that I had been playing inside ball here too long and um, that it just simply wasn't going to work um, with, uh, uh, particularly the faculty. There were, you know, uh, sometimes you burn your bridges uh, <laughs> with uh, the faculty, and I just felt like um, I wasn't the person to to do it. So I had just sat on the sidelines and um, and the search. I think they interviewed four candidates and uh, didn't identify. Uh, someone that they wanted to hire. And so really the trustees then kind of turned to me uh, and said, would you consider doing this? And uh, I said, of course, you know. Uh, and, and the understanding was I would only be interim, I wouldn't be a candidate, as I hadn't been the first time. Uh, and I was very flattered. I, I, I will say, I think, having later become a college president, uh, the best job in the world is interim president. <laughs> I, I would love to be interim president for about 15 different schools because everybody's angling for the next person, you know, and uh, and people are very nice. They treat you well, and, and so we had a great year. Yeah, that that did, was a yeah. fantastic year. Yeah. Uh, we enjoyed that. And as, as he agreed with what Vivian had told him over the years that being a college president is in some ways easier than being the academic dean yeah. because you know, you're more the ambassador for the school, you know, there's more outreach to donors and that sort of thing and less, you know, internal politicking, I guess. Yeah, yeah she was right. Yeah. <laughs> so what parts of the job as an interim president, well, We'll go into the kind of become the college of Idaho president in a little mm -hmm. bit, but mm -hmm. what parts of the interim president job did you enjoy the most? Well, I, I really enjoyed the public relations side of it, and I, I actually got a little bit more of a taste. I, Vivian had been very good about involving me in some of the fundraising for uh, after we got the, the donation of this land that this library sits on. and. Uh, um, 
we got the uh, uh, Hewlett Packard to donate the land, and then we launched the comprehensive campaign that made it a reality. Um, she involved me uh, with certain donors that she thought that we would hit it off with and things like that. So I did a little bit of that. Um, not a lot, but enough to figure out what was going on and things like that. And then when I was interim president, I really found that I enjoyed that. I, I really liked meeting people. You don't sneak up on people when you're asking them to support <laughs> higher education. They know you're coming. I mean, if a college president schedules a meeting with them, it's usually <laughs> going to be about money. And uh, you meet some really interesting people who have got good hearts and want to do something for their alma mater if they're alumni, or a lot of times not alumni. Mm -hmm. So I think I enjoyed that the most, mm -hmm. that part of it. So while you're part of the community here, how did Linfield change? How did the, how did the campus and community change, mm -hmm. if at all? Well, oh boy, uh, you have to go way back. I, I, when I first came, Vivian was very clear that the, the focus, my focus, of course, being the academic vice president, was going to be on the quality of the academic program. Uh, she felt like we needed to um, redo the curriculum, uh, the general education curriculum in particular. Uh, it was kind of tired and nobody quite knew why it was there. It had died the death of a thousand cuts and uh, it just wasn't all that. So I think one of the reasons I was hired was that I had done a lot of that. I'd started the honors program at the University of Idaho and I'd come up with, um, I studied honors curricula across the country for a year before I ever did that and that was a condition for me to take the job. And so I had started a, a, a curriculum there and then gotten a large grant to help develop that curriculum. And I think that was one of my edges in the interviews. And so, you know, the first thing we did was revitalize the curriculum. And I'm, I'm proud to say, I was looking at the catalog, you'd recognize the Linfield curriculum of today is pretty much the curriculum the faculty passed after two years, uh -huh. my first two years. And it, it really, you know, that idea of habits of mind and shuffling uh, disciplines and, mm -hmm. you know, ultimate questions. You can have a history class or a Shakespeare class uh, satisfy ultimate questions, just not philosophy or religion. Sure. I, I think that's a very innovative way of thinking. It was, it, it was certainly innovative at that time. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of publicity for that. And then we got a Hewlett Foundation grant for faculty development from that. So. The first years were really working inside on the curriculum. And there was a really good feeling in those first years. The, the faculty were excited about it, particularly when we got the grant and we got some development money from them. Uh, we were excited about it. And, uh, and so we built on that. And then the Hewlett Packard plant closed. <laughs> And uh, they'd called Vivian before uh, the, uh, the, the president of this campus here uh, called Vivian and gave her a first alert that mm -hmm. they were going to be closing, that they were going to be announcing the closing. And we all thought immediately that this belonged to us because the uh, Hewlett Packard had uh, bought out um, Femcor Corporation, which Walt Dyke, uh, the famous alumnus physicist, uh, et cetera, had started. So we felt like this was our property in a way, even though it really wasn't, mm -hmm. you know. And that just changed everything. We had a strategic plan going. We had, you know, it was focused mainly on academics, very little building. Uh, and then all of a sudden, we were faced with um, expansion needs, you know, we had to expand the student body to pay for the space. You know, we raised, I mean, Vivian raised the money for the rehabilitation of the buildings, pretty much, but we had to bond the, the new residence halls and 
uh, we needed to pay operating expenses on sure. the, this expanded space. So we added 15%, I think, to the square footage of the campus in five years. Mm. And that, that, was, that was really something. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was an exciting time <laughs> for the college. Mm -hmm. Did you notice anything on campus that changed while you were part of the community? Other than the other than the physical, than the physical the, the, yeah. the, um, wow, you know the the constant on campus was the the student body. I mean, they're just a wonderful, friendly group generally, and um, it's it's always fun to go watch them perform, do sports. So, um, you know, other than the growth of the buildings and the oak trees, you know, over the years, <laughs> um, you know, just just a pleasant atmosphere on the campus always. One of the things we always like to ask people who are here for a while about is the relationship between McMinnville and mm. Linfield because mm -hmm. it's such a special mm -hmm. relationship. Do you have any, any memories of that? Any examples oh, of that? Oh, very definitely. Um, I, um, I, I got uh, involved early on in the McMinnville Kiwanis Club. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, met some, that, that was my entree to the community. And uh, it, it, there were some tough times early on and I had the support of some leaders of the community through my association there. And, um, and then Partners in Progress, you know, the fundraising, um, I, I suspect it's still called that. I, I can't imagine why they would change the name. <laughs> For the community to raise three or four hundred thousand dollars a year uh, for the campus, that, that was, you, you don't find many places to do that. And so, of course, I, we got involved early there and some of my, my good buddies from Kiwanis and, and, you know, other leaders, you know, became leaders in that. Harold Washington and Linda Schwichtenberg, mm -hmm. who was a fellow Kiwanian and things. And, that just gave us such a sense of belonging that these people uh, cared that much about the campus. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so I'm, you know, I, I understand it's still a very healthy relationship. It is. It's an amazing, amazingly so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the town we just moved from, Caldwell, where the College mm -hmm. of Idaho is, um, they're trying to revitalize their downtown right now. And I believe you said they've sent part of the Revitalization Committee members to McMinnville to see uh, how the downtown, you know, has just blossomed, and also that college uh, community relationship, which College of Idaho would like to see more of. Yeah. Um, this is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. Caldwell is not a college town yet. Not it's really. Not yeah. really. It's starting but to be, it's, but it's yeah. it, 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 a pro it's a work yeah. in progress. Mm -hmm. But you know, we I, I really we found it healthy when we got here. We participated, and it's still going on, you know. So it, it, it was rewarding, but I don't think we had much to do with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, it didn't screw it up. That's right. <laughs> that way, we didn't screw it up. Do, yeah, right. right. Yeah. You got something healthy. I imagine a lot of towns are, or a lot of colleges are jealous of this relationship. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think they are, yeah. 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 So you talked a little bit about when you took over as the, as the VP of Academic <laughs> Affairs, you talked about your role in reshaping the curriculum. What, as you stayed in that role and the curriculum had been, what else did you find yourself, what else did you see your role on campus being? I think the most important thing that an academic dean does, um, and it's easy to overlook because it's a continuous responsibility, but the dean is responsible for the recruitment and then professional development of the faculty, and you know, I'm. I've. It, it's kind of a trite saying, but uh, presidents come and go, uh, trustees come and go, students come and go, but the faculty are forever. <laughs> you know? And you've always got to remember that at at a at an institution because the faculty have a special role in academic governance of the institution. They have a special role uh, in the curriculum. It's really their curriculum, you know. Um, whenever you revise it, you have to get a, a substantial plurality within the faculty to, to do that. They, 
uh, are delegated the responsibility for setting student conduct, standards of conduct, and things mm -hmm. like that. So they're, you know, they're, they've got a huge role in institutions like Linfield. So I think by the time I left the dean's office to become interim president, um, I think I had uh, been responsible for hiring just over half the faculty. Because that was, I, I was dean 12 years, oh, I yeah. think, 12 years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, we expanded hugely. You know, we, we, uh, there, were, there were two years back to back we had, I think, 13 or 14 searches and wow. 13 or 14 positions. You know, a lot of replacements, but a lot of new mm -hmm. positions too. We were, we were expanding mm -hmm. uh, because we were, you know, we went from about 1,400 students to over 1,700 students. So that was a substantial sure. responsibility. And then you've got to find the funds to make sure they're supported in their scholarship and uh, you've got a budgetary responsibilities for that. And it, it's very easy to lose sight of that. And, and Vivian was, again, she was exemplary, I think, as a leader, at least for me, in that she always wanted to, when she was in town, she wanted to meet uh, all the faculty that came that she could. She wasn't always in town. Uh, but she would interview them by phone if she didn't meet them. Mm -hmm. And she always wanted to make sure that I called her to get her input <laughs> on it. Of course. Mm -hmm. But she left the hiring up to me and to the faculty. And I think that's, in the long run, that's the most important responsibility that you've got. And, uh, you know, because it, it's expensive to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive to make a mistake. <laughs> Uh, because if somebody after six years doesn't get tenure, that's probably cost the institution more than just their salary that, you know, it's, there. it's probably, there's probably a few unhappy students, there's, sure. you know, it, 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 it's not a good investment. You, you don't want to make that kind of mistake. Mm -hmm. When you were recruiting, what, how did you, how did you find Linfield's reputation to be as you were recruiting faculty? I, oh, I, we, we had, I think we got our first or second choice 90, 95% of the time. Um, I think the, and I don't think that I had so much to do with that as the departments and the search committees. Uh, the process was really designed to let people know the values of the community. There were always students on the search committees. There was always, you know, the hand, I, I hope the handbook still requires that a student be on every faculty search committee. And, and there were always meetings with the students. And I listened very carefully, you know, that we would make sure every candidate met with a group of students apart from the faculty, mm -hmm. apart from the dean. And I paid, I paid special attention to that because there were, there were sometimes candidates would come through and they would just blow off the students. Mm. You know, they'd think, oh, this is just pro forma. This is really not an important part of the thing. Mm. And if I got any hint that that's what was happening, mm. that person was not going to get hired, you know. And it didn't happen very often. Sure. I mean, most people who wanted to come here loved the students mm. and, and the students would report back and, and they'd, they'd love everybody, you know, who came. And so it wasn't, it was, but sometimes they would, uh, I remember a couple times in particular where they uh, wouldn't do it. So I think the, the values of the community spoke to people. And most of the people that came, they wanted to be at this kind of institution. They wanted to put teaching first and uh, scholarship second. So we found that you have the uh, Marvin Laura Hinberg International Scholarship Award mm -hmm. in your name, endowed in your name. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. You can probably speak to a little bit of that. But we had a lot of fun. Yes, we um, when Marv hired Sheikh Ismail to run the international programs here, uh, we it developed into a, a wonderful working relationship for them and also a, a personal relationship with Meg and Sheikh and us because we got to travel. Um, to these areas where they wanted to recruit exchange programs and start those up. So it was just one of the great pleasures of, of your time as uh, academic vice president and 
interim president um, to get to travel. So that it's it's a big it's a big thing for us to mm -hmm. support that. <laughs> and and Sheikh, you know, Sheikh had uh, the year we hired him, he was given the the um, by the one I can't remember which. Um, alphabet soup of international programs. <laughs> I think there are several of them, but he'd just been given the Distinguished uh, Service Award for, the, for his uh, professional organization, and then we hired him away from Chatham, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he actually got that after we'd made the offer to him, mm -hmm. you know. He, we didn't even know he was in the running for it. And so I really felt like we had somebody here who could take international programs, which was strong already. To the next level, and we, you know, he certainly did that. So I think we were we were particularly close to that, mm -hmm. uh, and and part of it had to do with seeing the students. Um, we, after I stepped down and went back to the faculty, I did that for a couple of years after the interim presidency. We, I, I think you would say this was a highlight. Mm -hmm. uh, we took 13 students to the to Ecuador and did a, a January term course called Environmental Ethics in the, in the Galapagos. Oh, cool. And I think mm -hmm. we, we bonded with those 13 oh, yes, students yes. <laughs> a lot. Uh, and it was important to have Laurie along because uh, there were certain, you know, you get a mix of men and women together and they were much more comfortable, the women were much more comfortable mm. going to Laurie about mm. certain things mm -hmm. than they were yeah. You know, hey, so. yeah, it was great. We went into the Amazonia and to the jungle and went to a research station and then from there out to the Galapagos Islands for several days. So That's really cool. it was wonderful. Yeah. And the students, I thought, I think by and large, thought it was wonderful as well. <laughs> and, and that whole um, connection with Ecuador, which was still quite strong that we have, that came about um, right after I had hired Sheikh, I was at a conference. Uh, I think the American Association of Colleges and Universities, and I went to a symposium session on international education. And the provost of Boston College, or no, Boston University, it was Boston University, was talking about this liberal arts college in Ecuador, hmm. Universidad de San Francisco de Quito, that they had this uh, exchange relationship with. And I thought, you know, because I, so many of the Latin American countries, all of them in fact, have the European model of education where they have major universities and they research-oriented faculty, and they let in tens of thousands, sometimes 40, 50,000 students, and most of them never finish their degrees because nobody can find the faculty, and they're underfunded, and they're, you know, it's just kind of a disaster. And this um, liberal arts college that the provost was describing sounded like how did this ever happen mm -hmm. you know, uh, to do that? And so I came back from that meeting and I, I met with Sheikh and I said, Sheikh, I think we ought to look into this because I said, this might be a perfect partner. And we wanted this to expand in out of, we had Costa Rica at that time, but we wanted another Spanish speaking venue. We wanted a venue that would work for sciences because the students, there, there, there are two classes of students that didn't go abroad as much, athletes and um, science students. Because mm. science students were locked into their curricula, uh, and they're locked in and they feel like they can't go. So, you know, many do, but a lot of them feel like they can't go. And so what attracted me to the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito was that they had wonderful laboratory space. And uh, so when we went down there and visited it, it turned out to be exactly what this provost had said. <laughs> that um, uh, it was, uh, they were serving students, they were graduating students, they were teaching on the American model of the liberal arts college that 
uh, the, the founding president and provost were both had American PhDs or Ecuadorians. And uh, we saw this laboratory facilities and we said, oh, science students can come down here and they can do their lab work and take a semester here and, and do that. So um, we signed a memorandum of understanding right away and then developed that. Um, then I taught the course on the Galapagos and now I think they're, they're regular courses mm -hmm. that go down there in January term. And Sheikh just told me to, last night that they have a Galapagos student here mm -hmm. again from mm -hmm. uh, who's taking uh, language training and things. So that was, uh, I, I, again, I feel very proud that we were able to do that. Did you, did you guys, get, did you get an idea how that school had come to be? I mean, you said it was founded by American PhD. Yeah, Ecuadorian, right. But how did, how did it survive? Well, it's amazing. Um, they actually, the, the, the president and provost, uh, I don't know how it is today. The governance structure is very interesting. They own the college, mm -hmm. so it's it's. They didn't have a board of trustees. Mm -hmm. They actually owned the college. Uh, as far as I could see, they weren't making a great deal of money out of it because they were pouring everything that they mm -hmm. got back into the college. You know, but they had beautiful grounds mm -hmm. and nice. You know, it was so different from a lot of. Uh, South American institutions, you know, the, the, the public sector in so much of Latin America is just impoverished. And the facilities are in bad shape. We've been to Mexico, for instance, mm -hmm. a couple of times, and, and, and wonderful people, wonderful institutions, but the institutions are falling apart. Mm -hmm. The grounds were well kept, the mm -hmm. buildings were beautiful, they were well maintained, attractive, lots of students. Um, but the president and the provost owned it. And I don't know if that's still mm -hmm. the case or not. Uh, and uh, they had to fight the bureaucracy a lot, uh, you know, to do that. But, uh, and then Diego Caroga, who was uh, the director of the Galapagos Institute, um, he helped us team teach the class uh, on the environmental ethics of the Galapagos. I think he may be a partial owner of it too. Mm. He's pretty high up mm -hmm. in the administration. Uh, so it, 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 there's no comparison to anywhere else, mm. except that they really did cater to the students. You know, they, they had the, exactly the same attitude as a Linfield does. Mm -hmm. So to change tracks a little bit, um, you co-wrote Inspired Pragmatism. Barbara Seidman, uh, what made you want to take on a project like that? Well, um, that's kind of interesting. I had um, been um, the uh, unofficial historian of Linfield, thanks to Vivian. <laughs> um, I, I remember we started you know, the new part of my responsibilities when I came here was to interact with the trustees. And um, so I was, early on, I came here to the archives. Well, it wasn't here, <laughs> it was <laughs> over in, the, in what's now the um, TJ, Day. TJ Day Center. Um, and uh, I'd, I went down and I'd go down to the archives and I'd um, find a little snippet about Linfield history that pertained to 50 years ago or 75 years ago that had to do with the season and things. So mm -hmm. I, I would find a little something that was going on and then when I'd give my report to the trustees, I'd always kind of highlight it with that. Well, that became very popular mm -hmm. with the trustees. So, after it went down well once or twice then, I was obligated, you know, <laughs> I, uh, you know. So I had poked around in the archives all this time. And uh, so one of the um, uh, agreements that I had uh, was that, you know, I'd been dean for 12 years. Um, I was also a tenured faculty member, uh, and I 
of course, as an administrator, I didn't ever have a sabbatical. And so I asked the trustees to approve a sabbatical for me at the end of uh, time. And I, f I figured that would be good for Tom Helley, too, because I'd be out of town and he'd be starting and, and doing all that. And <clears throat> so I just, you know, it was coming up on the sesquicentennial. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the trustees and, and uh, well, I think I'd mentioned it to Vivian first and then uh, and to Bruce Wyatt, who was at that time Vice President for Advancement. And I said, you know, we, you really shouldn't have 150th without a Linfield history. And um, I said, I don't see anybody out there ready to write it, you know. Uh, the history faculty were all buried in their own concerns. They weren't going to write a uh, college history. Uh, and um, so I said, you know, if, if you would like, I would volunteer to do the history on this, on my sabbatical. And um, the, um, uh, uh, the trustees were intrigued by that. Um, and um, I also said that I would only do it if I had full editorial control. I would let, I would let people read it and respond to it, but I wasn't going to, you know, again, I believe in academic freedom and sure. I wasn't mm -hmm. going to, I wasn't going to devote the time to it unless, you know, the, the trustees own the copyright, but I was going to do that. So I'd, I started doing that and then I brought Barbara in to, she was really the editor and then wrote the, the afterword uh, to the book. She was a great editor, you know, she helped uh, with that, but I spent the year we went yeah, over to Sun River right. and we came over here a lot. I spent a lot of time. And you went through how rooms. many photographs? How many photographs? I think did I you went through 11,000 photographs <laughs> and narrowed the. We had, uh, you should still have the digital versions of them. We had about just over a thousand of them copied in digital version that were the best ones. And I think we came up with 156 or something like that for the book. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, that took that took a long time going through the, all those photographs. And uh, somebody had done a good job, though. Somebody had, at one time, they had a grant for an archivist for about a year, a year and a half. So it was very well mm -hmm. organized. It mm -hmm. was it was easy to use. The rest of the archives were not very user friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so what what did you? What did you think about the history of Linfield? I mean, it's also been my research focus for, mm -hmm. since I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it strikes me that the, it doesn't seem like the college should exist. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There are, you know, um, I, I, read, I read about eight or ten college histories uh, before I started the project just to kind of get a sense for when I read Oberlin's and Reed's and, mm -hmm. and Washington and Lee, my alma mater, um, University of Idaho, College of Idaho, because I had a friend who wrote that one. Um, so I read a lot of college histories. And it's not unique to Linfield that it shouldn't exist, <laughs> 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 that it shouldn't have survived, that it, it almost you know, folded several, several times. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the story, particularly in the West of, because the West uh, came after the Morrill Act, uh, you know, the Morrill Act established land-grant colleges. So public education is dominant in the West, thanks to President Lincoln and the Morrill Act. And so these institutions like liberal arts colleges, private liberal arts colleges that are so common in the Midwest and the East and thriving, because they, they didn't really have public competition for a long time. Right. Now, some of them had checkered histories too, but, but they're a lot stronger. In the West, it was really tough to do that. And most of the denominational colleges like Linfield um, struggled with their denominations, of course. You know, the denominations barely had enough money to keep a church going, let alone a, a college mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, um, and that's, that's really why I came up with that title, Inspired Pragmatism, because it seemed to me that it was an act of faith. Well, you know, I, I, I developed great admiration for those early presidents who were um, struggling to make ends meet, and uh, we had the time. Uh, and, you know, Leonard Riley, I think, was the most interesting of those early presidents. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, you, when you live with people in that way, uh, as I did, you know, read all his papers and all the uh, executive committee minutes and the trustee minutes from his era and things like that, I really think I would not have cared for the man. I think he was pretty straight-laced and stiff-necked and, and pretty demanding person. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't help but admire him because he had a determination that was that, that the college needed, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, they just there were a series of presidents up to that time who were just doing their best, but they didn't have the tools to do the job. And then Leonard Riley was hired, and um, and he really had the contacts with the Baptist organizations as well as the drive to look uh, at, under every stone for sure. support for the college. He and, was here for 25 years. and he was here, yeah. He, was, he had that, in, that, that long span and career. And I, you know, I think it, in the College of Idaho, for instance, had a founding president who was president for 46 years, William Judson Boone. And he is much like Riley. He was mm. a Presbyterian minister rather than a Baptist minister. But um, I, I think the colleges that did survive, they needed that kind of person. Because if you don't get that kind of president, you know, and I can't even remember the names of the several that didn't survive in the Santium region, but there are several <laughs> that mm -hmm. didn't survive. And I think it's because they didn't have that, that, that one leader who could come forward and really secure things. The right person mm -hmm. at the right time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Leonard Riley was clearly that. And Charlie Walker was another one, you know. Uh, the college had a very precarious time in the late 60s. And if Charlie Walker hadn't had the, the vision, I mean, he, he, he brought the Portland campus in, he brought, um, he, 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 he started the international uh, emphasis, and he 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 knew that the college couldn't just cut its way to prosperity, though they needed to cut the budget. That they had to have something that gave hope, and international was his big mm -hmm. contribution. And then the the DCE program uh, with that, that he 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 very very innovative, uh, and I th so I think you know. In terms of presidents who made the most difference, I, th I would say it was Riley and Charlie Walker. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, just from a historical perspective. Yeah. I remember reading in your book, and I don't remember which year it was, but I remember when they hired they hired two presidents who didn't show up right. after mm -hmm. they hired them. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just, mm -hmm. I remember reading that, and it's just, how does this yeah. happen? Yeah. This doesn't show up on the day you're supposed to start work? Yeah, that, and mm. then, uh, oh yeah, they had a very hard time in there. They were promoting faculty members who were, you know, and you read some of the, what memoirs exist from some of those presidents, and I can't remember which one it was now, but one of them just, in his diary, it was just, you know, he was saying of himself, I'm the last person who should be doing this job, you know, he just, uh, what, what is this all about? He, he just, he, he had enormous self-doubt and it showed in, in his performance, you know. So was there one, one thing in particular that you learned on the project that stuck with you the most? Or a favorite fact or a mm. favorite story? Um, you know, I, I, the most fun thing that I learned that was really, it was, it was buried in the archives. I, I don't think anybody knew it um, until I finally ferreted it out, was that um, when Mrs. Linfield had given her gift of land in uh, Spokane, mm -hmm. 
valued, I think, at $250,000 at that time in the 20s. And then she came here to be dean of students and, and you know, lived here till she died. She died in 1948, I believe. And as soon as she died, her uh, nephews, great nephews, uh, oh no, I think it was a nephew, sued the college to get the estate back. And that was a pretty well hidden secret. Uh, I don't think it was ever public at the time. I Amazing. think that the trustees that. dealt with it behind the scenes. Uh, but there was a, a, a case in federal court in Spokane, um, and uh, um, the uh, heirs uh, to Mrs. Linfield tried to get that money back, and the um, the judge ruled that they had um, sat on their rights; that it, it was not timely. And so he, he never ruled on the merits of their claim. Uh, the claim was is that it was her brother's money that she transferred over here without right. authorization, that it really wasn't her husband's money, as the story was. And uh, we, we went to Spokane, and I dug mm -hmm. through the archives in, uh, in the Spokane City Hall, and and read every document I could find there about that. And I, I came to the conclusion that even if it had been decided on the merits, that, that, um, that she would have prevailed, that, that is, the college would have prevailed on that. That, that there wasn't, there may have been some admixture of her brother's money in that, but I, I think she was, a, she was pretty much what she, um, she portrayed herself to be. And, uh, but th that was a perfect example of why I wanted editorial control. Because when I started on that investigation, I didn't know what the result was going to be. Sure. You know? And if it turns out that Mrs. Mm. Linfield had taken the money from mm. her brother and mm. done what they alleged in the suit, you read the suit, and that's the allegation. Yeah. If, if I thought the facts supported that, I, I was going to tell the story. You know, come hell or high water, you know. <laughs> and people aren't going to like that about it. But it, as it turns out, I didn't have to do that. But that was the most fun part mm -hmm. of it. And it, again, would fit with Linfield's history of hanging on by a thread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, and it did, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So take us through the decision to go to the College of Idaho to become the president. I know it must have been a big decision for both of you. So how did that come about? <laughs> Oh, I had I had I had applied for a few presidencies outside, um, and been a finalist at a couple of them, and never had it. So I I went back to the faculty here and decided that um, that my time to be a president had passed. I'd had the interim job here. I didn't really need to be a college president. I I, I felt like I could do the job and would be happy doing the job for the right institution. And it was really funny because we were on vacation in Wyoming visiting my family, and I got an email from a friend who happened to be in Beirut, Lebanon at that time, at the American University uh, for a long time, and from Tom Helley on the same day. <laughs> and they both, the job had been posted at the College of Idaho, and they, they sent me this email mm -hmm. saying, you know, the job at the college, there's a job at the College of Idaho you might want to look at because Tom knew about my connections to Idaho sure. before and so did my friend Saul mm -hmm. uh, who was there and I thought well if there's a confluence of that and I remembered the College of Idaho quite fondly from my days as um, Idaho Road Secretary and, and then Oregon Road Secretary because the College of Idaho has had seven road scholars in its history which is second only to read in the Northwest Amazing. and um, so I knew it was a very fine academic institution. Uh, but I hadn't been there 20 years mm. or so. So we, we, we stopped by on our way back t to uh, McMinnville. Mm -hmm. uh, and we walked around campus. And the campus was just entirely different, uh, much more beautiful than I remembered. Mm -hmm. uh, it had grown. Uh, there had been a lot of new buildings added. And I thought, you know. Mm. 
Yeah. And this this is uh, you know I, I I had expected to see the college I remembered, which was mm -hmm. down on its luck and buildings in terrible shape and. And not then much. and plus you he knew Louis Atterbury, who's the uh, emeritus professor at C of I, who wrote the history of the College yeah. of Idaho. He yeah. had known him through the Humanities Association through the years in Idaho, and yeah. I think you contacted Louis oh, yeah, to say, you know, Louis, I'm yeah. thinking about applying, and Louis encouraged you, and... Uh, yeah. So I had, I had a tie th that way, and then, um, and then when I did apply, um, the, the fact that we already knew Idaho that was a big thing to the trustees. Um, they, 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 they felt like that was important, and, and it was. It, I, I, I didn't, we didn't have any accommodation. You know, most presidents move across the country and they become, you know, they don't know the community, they yeah, don't know anything. They're strangers when they're they They're strangers come. when they get there. We were not strangers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was pretty well known from my time at University of Idaho in the honors program, and we had, we, you know, we've got- We have friends, you know, through throughout Idaho, really, from all those years in Moscow. And, and you know, probably thousands of students from the yeah. honors program days that were now working in Idaho and living uh, mm -hmm. there. So we had a, a break. And um, so when they offered me the job, we looked at it as another adventure. And it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great. How did, the, how did it compare to McMinnville? How did it compare to Linfield? Well, Caldwell is a, uh, economically not near as prosperous as McMinnville. It's, a, it's kind of down on its luck, uh, hard times, uh, a and, lot of... And when we arrived was the Great Recession time, yeah, too. 2009, so. right after the stock market fell and the correction and things. Uh, but the community was pretty neat. Yeah, it's very friendly. It's close to Boise. It's 25 miles from Boise, and um, quite friendly. Which you know, so is this community. But um, we were welcomed, and it was uh, Marv's house. Our house was right across from campus, so it was just a walk, and that was mm -hmm. that was a great place to be. And we got a lot of good will from the community that I don't think we deserved, but we'll take it anyway, you know, uh, <laughs> because they had had two presidents uh, for over 25 years who refused to live in Caldwell. They, they lived in Boise and commuted in, and that did not go down well with the community at all. Well, the trustees made it a condition of the hire that we live in the president's house, which they remodeled for mm -hmm. us. It was yeah. a very nice Yeah, it house. was we were happy to live there. Yeah, I was, I mean, and I wouldn't have wanted to do anything but live on campus, sure. you know, or live That's with the students. The That's part of the fun, you know. It is. And, and so it's not like, it was a requirement that I would have, I would have embraced, I would have insisted on myself, you know. And, and being a college president is not a 40 hour a week job. Yeah. So the, the idea of commuting back and forth and, you know, there's so many evening events and, sure. and times you just have to be there late. I, I just thought how, we would never have wanted to live outside of town. No, we wouldn't, and, and but the community mm. thought it was us yeah. that chose to live <laughs> oh, there, yeah. and boy, did they! Yeah, uh, I mean, really? yeah, and so well, okay, we, we'll we'll take it. They said, "Oh, we're yeah. so glad you're living yeah. in, in Caldwell," yeah. and uh, uh, it, it gave us it, it. And then we got involved. Larry joined, joined Rotary, and I I joined Kiwanis. So I kept my Kiwanis membership up and. Uh, I met with the mayor uh, monthly or sometimes more than that um, and he was a very good, he was on the search committee mm, wow. and we developed a very close bond. Yeah, and, and, we, and we, we, we also met with the superintendent of schools too, right. trying to encourage more uh, kids to go on. Yeah, <laughs> from yeah. and we, we, we made great inroads and um, I think, I think we, we tripled the Hispanic population and, and student, uh, yeah. Caldwell student population. Caldwell is a majority Hispanic town now because of the agriculture sure. there. And uh, we're the most diverse campus by far in Idaho. And we were proud of that. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, you know, so there were just a lot of things there. And it's, it's starting to gel now. The, the, it, it, I think Caldwell, 
Um, the new president, Charlotte Borst, came from Whittier, uh, mm -hmm. just succeeded me. I think she's going to, when she retires, uh, whenever that is, she will be able to to say that Caldwell is a college town. Mm. I think it's on, I, you wouldn't say mm. that now, mm. but you would, you, mm. I think she'll be able to say yeah, that. It's, it's heading that way. Yeah. What would you, how did you feel your role was as a, as a president's wife? What did you try to accomplish? Well, I tried to be there, show up, and, and we learned this from Vivian, you know, that when we were here. Vivian went to everything, uh, you know, every evening production. I mean, sometimes she couldn't go because there were three or four of them. She'd go to something every day and every night. Uh, and we, we did that at C of I. And if he was out of town, I would still go. You know, obviously, I enjoyed going. So I think showing up and uh, being there was, was my main role. <laughs> and then the community work. I did join Rotary and I volunteered in one of the schools. It wasn't the SMART program. They didn't have that set up, but it was similar to the SMART program in Oregon, reading with third graders and um, just, you know, kind of tried to be out there as an ambassador in the community uh, for the school, which, and it was easy to do and it was fun to do because um, we really liked the people there. But. You know, the world belongs to those who show up. And just being there, it, it, it's amazing yeah, yeah. How, how, you know, the students loved it. Mm -hmm. um, they called us Marv and Laurie, you know. I, I encouraged them to, 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 to do that. And uh, I, I don't think we missed a play in six years. I don't mm. think we, you know, um, we went to almost, went to every sporting event that we possibly could. Mm -hmm. We went to, uh, to the concerts there, mm -hmm. the fine, fine art series there, uh, symphony uh, and things like that. And, you, you know, as a president, you learn a lot by casual conversation. Sure. Because people will approach you in a social setting and tell you things <laughs> that they won't make an appointment to come into your office and tell you. And so it's a good way of keeping your ear to the ground. Um, but also generating goodwill. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The other thing I did, and this, I don't know that Vivian did exactly this, but you know, uh, Vivian has a very common touch. She's, she's present to everybody, whether it's a physical plant worker or a faculty member or a distinguished visitor. Mm -hmm. She treats everybody well. And she, she always has time she doesn't brush people off. Uh, if, if, if you want to talk to Vivian, you get her attention and she treats you well. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I did when I got to the College of Idaho was I took the organizational chart and I turned it upside down. So the trustees were at the bottom and the president was next to the bottom. <laughs> And the uh, clerical people and the uh, and the maintenance and operations people were at the top, and that reminded me mm. that I would go and I would again. We learned this from Vivian. Vivian would put on her tennis shoes and walk out to physical plant, you know, to talk to people, or she'd go to um, the, um, the people who were doing setup for the, you know, and all that sort of stuff, and just kind of thank them and be with them and walk across campus picking up, oh, picking up trash litter. and garbage. <laughs> and, and, and we both did that. We, we never walked across campus, but we picked uh, uh, things up. And you know, people started doing it, you mm. know, because we were doing it, they would do it. And uh, uh, the, 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 when we left, uh, it, it was very gratifying. The, the, the support we got from maintenance and operations people and uh, clerical people in the registrar's office or whomever, you know, they just, they, they were sorry to see us go mm -hmm. and made us feel very, uh, it was hard to go in some ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So what is it like having the beginning of a school year happening and not having an active role in it? Oh, it's kind of nice in a way. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I wondered how that would be because I've, I've, if you count my freshman year at Washington and Lee, um, which was 1966, I've had 49 years of being on the academic 
calendar, and now this is my 50th, and I'm not on it. But we kind of cheated because we went back to uh, to College of Idaho for the first two football games of the year and for a raft trip with our friends there. So we kind of got a sense of it, you know, starting, and now we're here for homecoming, <laughs> which is right at the beginning yeah. of school. Sure. And so we're kind of living it vicariously. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a much more relaxed way. <laughs> yeah, in a much more relaxed way. So when you talked about um, when Tom Helley took over, how did you how do you feel the camaraderie is between like Linfield presidents or between College of Idaho president past and past presidents? Uh, oh, I think that's I think it's very good. I I, I made a I made a point of um, of. Um, Making sure that uh, Charlie Walker and Tom Helley were introduced before before we stepped aside, we had we had them all over for dinner before Tom accepted the job, um, and of course I was very very close to Vivian, and I know Vivian has uh, kept up with Tom uh, well too. Uh, so I think there's a there's a sense of shared pride, you know. That uh, I mean, it's a privilege. That being college president is the best job in the world. It really is, you know. Uh, of, um, uh, and uh, you know, the spending your life on, on behalf of 18 to 22 year olds at a traditional institution like this, it's a privilege. And I think they all feel that, and mm. they feel a bond because of that. Mm -hmm. So where do you see Linfield going in the future, or where would you like it to go? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, well, I, you know, I would begin with, I mean, we, we started the Faculty International Development uh, Fund for a reason. So I would hope that it would continue to emphasize international education. I think there's a special niche. Um, I don't know if it's true, but you know, I spend a lot of time on the demographics of the student body. And one study we did back then was that about two thirds of our students come from small towns, um, under under 20,000 population. I don't know if that's still true, but we found when working with admissions that. There was a reason for that because students from small towns, not infrequently, are intimidated by a University of Washington or a University of Oregon. You know, a university of forty thousand people is twice their town, and they mm. they don't want to get lost. They don't. You know. So, liberal arts colleges tend, I think, it's true of College mm. of Idaho too, and um, so. That makes for a real special challenge, it seems to me. One is you get people with really good habits of mind, discipline, they, they have small town values, they're very courteous, polite people on the whole, mm -hmm. because that's how they've been raised. Sure. They have a strong work ethic. Um, many of them have worked on a ranch or a farm or you know, been working since they were 14 or 15 someplace. Um, but they don't have a lot of cultural capital. They don't, they, they haven't seen the larger world. They've been confined, you know, it's nothing against them, but they've just been in that sort of thing. So I think, I've always thought that Linfield, A. Linfield, which draws on that kind of student, um, has a special obligation to widen student horizons, you know, and international education is a great way to do that. It's not the only way to do that, but it's, it's, it's a great way to do that. So I would, I would hope that it would continue to be a leader as it is in international education. Um, and build on that. Uh, beyond that, I really, I, my crystal ball is pretty <laughs> cloudy. <laughs> I, you know, I, it's tough. Um, you know, the cost of tuition, 
the need to provide scholarships, uh, the financial model of private higher education, it's a problem and it's a continuing challenge and I, you know, I, I worry about it. I worried about it as a president, I worried about it when I was a dean and I'm glad not to be worrying about it anymore. <laughs> and I don't have the magic solution to that. I really don't. Sure. Anything to add about Linfield's future? Oh, I feel like it's got to be bright um, <laughs> just because it's a quality institution and in a beautiful setting. But I know that, you know, the demographics are sometimes mm -hmm. not uh, going in a positive direction. So uh, I just say get the word out about Linfield. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, the other thing I think, I, I will add one more thing, and I certainly believe this about College of Idaho, too. You know, there's such a, a, a political focus on distance education or uh, online education these days, and mm -hmm. a lot of state legislators and people see that as a way of saving money and getting students through the pipeline faster and, you know, uh, they, they bought into that in a way, and, and there's a there's a an industry of proprietary institutions who are trying to sell that line out there. And you know, online education works for some students; it really does. So I, there's no question about that. But it doesn't work for every student. And the one thing that you cannot do virtually is performance kinds of activities. You know. Mm -hmm theater, mm -hmm. uh, music, um, art and drawing and things like that, uh, sports, all those things. If you're doing them virtually, you're not doing them, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, you, you, you're just not. Uh, so you have to have a community to, to do theater, to do mm -hmm. Uh, play football, to music, and do music, and yeah, et, et cetera. And I think that, that one of the, the fonts of popularity of small colleges is that community sense. And students still want to participate in those kinds of activities. And if you sit at home on a computer, you may get the content of an education, but you don't get the full experience. So I, I, would, I would hope that future presidents and future faculty and future administrators realize the importance of those activities. They're not just sidelights. Mm. They're integral to the survival of the, the, the college because I think there will always be a demand for mm. that kind of uh, uh, living. So I, 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 would, I would think that, you know, I've said many times, um, uh, Ad Rutchman um, saved the school as much as any mm -hmm. college president saved the mm -hmm. school. You know, I mean, he would, uh, when he was athletic director, Charlie Walker would come to him and say, Ad, we need 15 more students to make the budget. And <laughs> Ad would get his coaches out there and they'd get 15 or 50 more students, you know, to, uh, to, to come. And they're some of the best recruiters around. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I know the faculty didn't always appreciate that. The, you know, that's one of the reasons I didn't, you know, the faculty sometimes had this view that athletics was emphasized too much at Linfield. And I was pretty much part of emphasizing mm -hmm. it. And there were some tensions there, but I, I make no apologies for that because I think it is a comparative advantage of the college, mm. you know. And, uh, and I would continue to fund, as, as we did at College of Idaho, yeah. I, I, put, I, I put a disproportionate amount of our budget dollars into athletics at the College of Idaho when I got there, too. And, and I think it's paid dividends. Yeah, because it's brought in students that, for instance, starting the football program there, these were young men that really wanted to play college ball, and if they were going to play small college ball, they had to go outside the state of Idaho, and now they have this, you know, opportunity to be right in the Treasure Valley, and mm -hmm. so. so. getting back to that a little bit, I want to expand on that a little bit. When you're talking about working with faculty and trying to get to some sort of 
majority or mm -hmm. consensus. I imagine that's a pretty difficult thing to do with everybody kind of wanting their own piece of the pie. How did you go about being a consensus builder among faculty? Well, I, I, I identified the right leadership to help me uh, early on. Um, when we did the curriculum revision, um, I, I kind of went around. First of all, my first year, I met every faculty member in their office as vice president, and I just listened to them. I, I literally, I had, I had three questions. Um, um, what's it like teaching in your subject? Um, uh, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> and what does a new dean need to know? Okay, so I, and, and then that was it. I went to listen and I took extensive notes and I got to know, have a sense for the faculty mm -hmm. at that time. And I identified people that I thought would be willing and able to lead the curriculum discussions and do that. And so I waited till my second year when I had, had a sense for people. And then I appointed the people that I was most impressed with through the interviews, who had given me good ideas and given me a sense that they wanted to do something too. So I stacked the committee clearly, you know, but <laughs> that's what you gotta do. Sure. You, you, stack, sure. you stack the committee with people who you know that their peers respect and trust. Because they're not gonna trust a new dean, mm. believe me. <laughs> they're, 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 they're gonna be suspicious of that. You're an outsider, uh -huh. you know. Uh, I got taken to the woodshed by the senior faculty more than once, you know. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, and you know, people like Jeff Summers and Barbara Seidman were two of the main leaders. They ultimately became associate deans with me and worked on that. Um, and they had, they had the talents and the passion and that. And so we, we worked with that and we had so many meetings about that Linfield curriculum that we finally when we brought it to the faculty assembly, it passed by 90%, I think. <laughs> and people were saying, enough. Let's vote on it. You know, they, they, we don't need another meeting. You know? And you've got to do that. Yeah. You know, because if you shortchange it, if, you, if, you, if they think that there's a train leaving the station, that, <laughs> that they haven't been, yeah. oh, man, the conspiracy theories and, and all the rest of it. You know? Well, uh, and then further along, when uh, the he, HP campus was, Keck campus was being developed, all of the meetings to get faculty input to program for oh, theater yeah. and oh, art oh, and music oh. and library and uh, yeah. <laughs> lots of input. Yeah, oh boy, <laughs> did oh man, I, I just, you know, programming this building, I, you know, uh, Barbara led the programming phase of this. No, she did the art building, I did the library and uh, and we both did music together. And, um, you know, but I, I mean, this is funny. The, the librarian, Susan, this is for you, Susan. Uh, many of the librarians at the time, you know, it was kind of, um, it was pretty much my idea to put the arts out here, the arts quadrangle. And, and I fit the library into that because I think research is an art too. You know, I think it's, you know, so uh, we were trying to figure out which programs to put out here because we had these big buildings and we needed to rehabilitate them and needed space. And we tried, we, we started with the sciences, you know, uh, tried to put physics out here and, and maybe chemistry and things because we thought, well, these are industrial buildings that'd be good for that kind of thing. It was the physics department that gave us uh, Femcor and sure. Hewlett Packard. We tried that. We tried all these combinations, and we had a consultant from San Francisco, and with the fundraising, working with uh, Lee Howard at that time was uh, vice president for advancement, and, and he, they just kept saying, "No, you know, you got to have something that's got a there there. You know, you you every, you yeah. can't just move <laughs> programs out there." So after he said that, one night I woke up and I said, an arts quadrangle. That's what we ought to do. We've got to put music, theater, art, and then the library, because we had, we clearly needed a new library. 
And so I came in after that and we were meeting with this consultant and I said, let's make it an art squad drink. Let's make the Ketz Ket campus an art squad drink. And he said, now there's an idea that you can get behind, mm -hmm. that you, you'll be able to raise money for because there's a, there's a there and there. So I always, whenever I come over here, I always feel like this is kind of my part of campus mm -hmm. <laughs> because of that. And then, you know, we did the programming with the library. But <clears throat> I don't think Susan was among them, but, but her colleagues in the library were ready to string me up by my thumbs <laughs> because they thought they were in the center of campus. Mm -hmm. And they called this Siberia. <laughs> and they were not happy at mm -hmm. all. And I won't name names. <laughs> But they were, and, and Susan was a good, loyal follower. I'm not, I don't know if Susan was convinced or not, but, <laughs> but she worked with me on it because she could see that the decision had been made and that you'd make the best of it. And to be fair to them, this building was hideous. Mm -hmm. It looked like, oh, it was awful. Mm -hmm. It was this low industrial, it had dark windows, it, it, it was, uh, unfriendly, you know, it, it, you know, in, industrial buildings are meant to keep people out. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I understood mm. that. They, they thought, it oh hard my to God, it was hard to envision could, what it could be. But we, but we hired the architect, John Meadows, and he was one of the most brilliant people I've ever had a chance to work with. He's just a wonderful man. And he, he just told me, he said, Marv, you, you will transform this building. You, you, will, you will be proud of it. Mm. And I just trusted him. I didn't mm -hmm. know anything about architecture mm -hmm. uh, to do that. And uh, so, and then of course we built all the, all the Keck campus residence housing out there. And you know, the, the gravity shifted toward this end of campus. And that filled in. Mm -hmm. And actually, from the student perspective, it's not Siberia. You know, it's next to where they live. You know, it's closer than sure. the old library used to be. So I, I, one of the things I like to think about is, is that by the time this building opened and they put the light monitors in and took the, the high ceilings in there, the ceilings were down just above your head because mm. all the, all the uh, heating and ventilation was up there and we put the heating into the floor and everything. When this building opened and they saw all this lovely wood uh, accent and the spaciousness and the light monitors, then everybody, it was everybody's idea <laughs> <laughs> to do this, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun, you know. And and the you know the the art building you know with that big light monitor and then above the gallery and that and then uh, <clears throat> after Vivian uh, uh, retired then um, she had started the fundraising for the music building and I was able to uh, do much of it to complete it then we did the music building in the same style. With mm -hmm. that and put music out here, and mm -hmm. so it gives a kind of focus to mm -hmm. it. So, what advice do you have for today's students? Same advice I've had for forty-nine years: <laughs> uh, study what you most want to study. Don't study what somebody else thinks you ought to study. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you study what you love even if it's something weird like philosophy, which was my major <laughs> in college, you will get the best academic record you can get because you'll be doing what you like to do. Um, and you will be satisfied with yourself because you have chosen it yourself. If you study something that you don't love, but you think is what somebody else thinks you ought to study because it's practical or useful or it's going to get you a job in the short run and all that sort of thing. Um, you won't get as good an academic record um, because you don't love it. You may well end up uh, abandoning it sometime down the road anyway because you, you didn't love it. 
and you won't feel so good about yourself, you know. And so it, that's always it, you know. Listen to everybody, you know. <laughs> families, you know, families in general want people to go to college, particularly families of first generation college students. They sure. want them to study business, and that's fine. Business is a great thing to study if you love uh, going into business. There's nothing wrong with that, but you better love it. You better make sure that's that's you that's speaking, not not your uncle or your sure. yeah, mm -hmm. etc. Um, so uh, you know, I I think that's tried and true. 